This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a wonderful guest on the phone with me today who has made a really interesting film that's celebrating its 35th anniversary this year, a film called Liquid Sky. I have director Slava Zuckerman on the phone. I pronounced your name right, did I not? Right, absolutely right, thank you. Okay, I actually listened to some videos and some reviews yesterday to get the right pronunciation because uh, you're the first one I've heard of with that name, but but you come from, you're Russian, and uh, you went through to Israel, and then you came here, is that right? Right. Okay. Do you mind, uh, before we get into your film career, if you would just give us a little bit of your background and how you come to get into cinema and your love of movies? Well, uh, I guess, like I heard from many filmmakers, I as well started very early. I remember making something which I was calling films when I was eight years old. Obviously, back then in Russia... Uh, you couldn't buy camera, no no video, no, no 16 millimeter, no any camera. And uh, I was building something which I was, it's actually were not movies, but all the kids from, from our neighborhood were in my, in my place. I was producing plays with them. And I always wanted to be a director. Even then, I didn't know that myself. When I was eight years old, I, it was my interest, but I didn't know that I want to be a director. Later, I realized that I want to be a director. Though, then I realized that it was a time in Russia, the most anti-Semitic time. And Russia had one film institute. Without diploma of this institute, you couldn't work in the film industry. And they were taking, like maximum 15 students to director department a year. Obviously, you know, it was from the entire Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and, and Africa, and all the developing countries. So obviously, they were not taking uh, Jew, 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 Jewish kids from Moscow, no Jews. And uh, it was an impossible dream to be a student at this institute. So... I needed to choose profession, and I chose in construction engineering and in architecture for many reasons, one of which was that Eisenstein was, as well, uh, his first profession was architecture. And probably I was right, because at that moment when I was student in, film, in, in the Construction Engineering Institute, it was crucial time, and something which was called uh, amateur filmmaking started. And I was among the first who started this movement in Russia. And being a student of this construction school, I made my first uh, feature short, uh, which was, uh, as I understand today, the first independent film in the Soviet Union. And, but nobody knew that it's an uh, independent film. It was called Amateur, though, uh, you know, by world definition, it wasn't Amateur. It was 35 millimeter film. And it was uh, it got first prize in uh, in the uh, in, in the national uh, Russian festival of amateur films and was released. It was theatrically released all over Russia. Uh, that really changed my life. By the way, besides of Russia, it got prize at some festival in Canada, but because you know filmmakers in Russia back then never got any information about festivals, only. Uh, only you know state functionaries were going to festivals, so I read about getting this prize from newspapers. Uh, Canada always played big role. I mean, I don't know if you know that, but Liquid Sky really had its premiere at Montreal Film Festival, and that was special prize of jury. Yep. Uh, there, actually, actually, they discussed very long. They wanted to give all the prizes to Liquid Sky, including. For, for directing, for acting, for 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 for, for camera, but uh, but after many discussions, they made decision to give to every film only one prize, and that's how we got the best jury prize. You know, it's interesting because I just discovered Liquid Sky about 
uh, I'd say less than two months ago. And I'll tell you how I come to discover it. And it made quite an impression on me. I, I watched a movie that I had never seen because I, I was big into horror films and whatnot, and especially the classics. And I had never seen a, a Alice Sweet Alice. And um, so I thought, well, I should check this out. And so I watched that. And, of course, uh, it's famous for being a very early Brooke Shields movie where she was just a, a child star in that. And uh, it had an actress in it by the name of Paula Shepard. And I, she made an impression on me, but I'd come to discover that she did the very same thing that Sissy Spacek pulled off successfully in Carrie, that Paula was 19 when she had done Alice Sweet Alice, but she looked no older than uh, Brooke Shields in that film. And I was like, wow, that... that so I wanted to see what else has Paula Shepard had done. And so I looked her up, and um, I didn't find a whole lot of information, but I discovered Liquid Sky. And I got hold of the film, and I took a look at it, and I was like, not only did I like what she did, but the film just blew me away. The innovation, the colors, the vibrant colors, and... And that was how I come to discover your film, and enough to contact you to celebrate its 35th anniversary. Okay, well, thank you. Well, you know, uh, Paula Shepard was chosen by us because of Alice with Alice as well. And actually, before Liquid Sky, I was developing uh, another film, a science fiction story, uh, called Sweet Sixteen, and we were casting leading uh, leading character was a girl who stays sixteen all her life because she 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 met scientist father met her mechanical body and she is staying she's already fifty but she is staying sixteen, and uh, it was very difficult to find uh, find an actress who can play a role like that, and and then we discovered Alice with Sweet Alice and immediately fall in love with Paula. But the film never was made because finally investor decided not to invest in it, uh, and uh, and uh, I realized that I need to do something new uh, which will be cheaper in production, and that's how Liquid Sky ap uh, appeared was written. And then was we were writing scripts for Liquid Sky. We really were writing roles for all the actors whom we know to use them. And uh, the girl who was real, real character, uh, Ed, which became Adrian in Liquid Sky, uh, was shocked by the script, did recognize herself, and it looked like we better not use her. And we decided that we need to cast uh, this character. And it was very difficult. We couldn't find a good actress who would, who would. Everybody was, you know, showing typical punks, but it was just image, not real character. And then I said, I want Paula because only Paula can play a strong character like that. Uh, Paula was completely different in her life. She was completely different character. She was more like hippies of sixties. She loved everybody, and you know, not 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 the mean person. And then she at first she was very happy that we want to play but then she read the script again she said i'm afraid i cannot play this negative girl and we spent i remember and Anne and me spent day explaining paula this character every every line why she do every action why she does it and then she understood the character she immediately became uh, like this character she's she's a fantastic actress and uh, then she really even started behave very much like this character, not only not only in front of a character. Yeah, I loved it there in that opening in the nightclub scene. She's singing uh, "Me and My Rhythm." Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, and she's and even the scene where she's. Uh, uh, clapping her hands, singing "Go to Hell," you know, and uh, like it's it's something very different. I don't understand why she didn't go on because I mean she definitely well, had. Just, What's that? Maybe because her talent. She actually then you know I was showing film in in, in Hollywood. I, I I remember every producer who seen the film first of all was falling in love with Paula and wanted her as an actress, and she never did it. She is very emotional, and uh, actually, we had in, in the film four actresses, members of SAG, 
of Screen Actors Guild. And uh, and we, we still used them, though the film was non-union. They agreed to do it because they had no any other work. And then film premiered in, in Montreal, and the review in Variety appeared. Screen Actors Guild wrote to all four, all these four actors uh, letter demanding why they were, uh, you know, why they were uh, doing this terrible action and playing in, in, in non-union film. And, uh, you, you know, we just, production company, decided that we're ready to pay for them if they, if, 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 you know, punished by demanding to pay. And we paid for everybody but Paula because she got mad and said they never helped me to get another role. They never did anything for me. Why should I pay them? She just made a scandal, and then probably that's why she didn't want to play another film after that. The producers of, uh, at a certain point, producers of Alice Vitalis wanted to make Alice Vitalis 2, and they tried to find Paula. They called me as well. I couldn't find him myself at this point, and I gave them all the, all, you know, all, all the telephones of her parents, of everybody whom, every information which I had, and it didn't help them. They still couldn't find her. Yeah, originally I tried to find her for an interview, but I kind of gave up. But I wanted to do something for Liquid Sky because it was just such a, a cool movie. But i got to say, I really loved her role as Adrian. Of course, she's the one that's uh, uh, provi- pro- pro- excuse me, providing all the drugs in the film. And, uh, and again, I, I thought Paula Shepard was so good in this movie, you know, and... and um, you know, it was quite a stretch for her. I think it, uh, I don't think it was an easy role for her to do, and I think she was brilliant. I thought she was brilliant. So, kudos to her. I loved her work in it. Yes, yes, she was fantastic. And what would you guys say? She wasn't. She was wasn't easy though. Not in the sense of acting. She after 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 she was explained the character, she did it very very easily and very good. One thing which was bad in her, uh, she was so emotional again that she never played two takes the same way. She always was different. She was finding some new new elements, new words. And it was difficult to edit after that very much because she was very different in different takes. Yes. And of course, you know... Um we definitely. I, I gotta get into uh, before I talk about Anne Carlyle. I gotta talk about, of course, for anybody who hasn't seen this uh, very innovative, creative film. Of course, it's uh, set during uh, uh, the punk scene, you know, and and it's got this little flying saucer that's like the size of a dinner plate that that makes its place on top of a building, and of course, it uh, it makes target of well first i think it's the drug use and then it's the the uh the sexual the orgasm and in the shards of glass and i was like i don't know like where did all these ideas come from because i'm i'm like i would never come up with this well i'll tell you that my idea was to make like a an anti anti fairy tale to make like a, a fable of the time. So I thought that I need to take all the cult elements which existed back then, all, 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 all the myths of the of the period, which was, you know, drugs, rock and roll, um, aliens from outer space, and put it all together. And, and as basis, the basic uh, Hollywood fairy tale story, that's Cinderella. So if Cinderella, always, uh, normal Cinderella, always finds her Prince Charming, uh, in, in the end, in, in this situation, the new Cinderella, the punk, punk new, a new wave of fashion model, cannot find uh, her Prince Charming in, in the society around her, and only Prince Charming for her, uh, ironically, happened to be the alien, alien from outer space. And, you know, I made a lot of, I'm really, as I told you, I was an engineer before filmmaker, and and when I became filmmaker, I first was making science documentaries. I always liked science, and it's happened with whatever I do, all the different films. I always start from research. And here, as well, I made a lot of research. Uh, I wanted to understand how drugs really work and how sex really works. And then I made my own conclusion that should be some 
connection in the brain between the between the orgasm reaction and 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 drug uh, and euphoria from drugs. It was my own conclusion, and then. I guess in the year or something, the scientists really came to the decision that there is a connection in the brain <laughs> between sex and between uh, sex and drugs. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, then uh, the um, AIDS happened, and everybody was speaking about connection between sex and drugs. But you know, we I. I Actually, AIDS already existed. Mm-hmm. Then we were making liquid sky, but we knew nothing about that. It wasn't yet so known. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, of course, um, Paula Shepard played Adrian, of course, and of course uh, she was partnered up with Anne Carlyle, who brilliantly plays two roles in the movie. She plays, of course, the central role of Margaret, and she plays the male counterpart jimmy kind of a rival you know and um uh, i love the two the t- contrast between the two roles you worked really well with Anne. yes uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, the idea of the script came together with the idea to use Anne in this part because Anne at that moment already was a close friend and was working on another script with my wife and uh, and she really was this person. She was a, a new wave fashion model. She had half of her hair red, half, half green. And uh, it really was my idea to use her character. And we did use her character and many, many elements from her real biography in the script. And uh, there was a boy, a real, a real boy like that, uh, whom we all knew, and this part was written for him. Actually, it was like both uh, Adrian was written not for Paula, and this role was written not for Anne. But this guy was negative towards script as well. She didn't like the way we showed him in the script. And and then we started casting, but actually I never was serious about this casting because Deep in my heart, I always knew that I want Anne to play both roles, because I knew that, you know, she, she's androgynous, and her, actually her mother, when she was a little girl, was calling her Jimmy, and mm-hmm. she was dressing in the boys' costumes. Then one day, we just dressed uh, Anne in my costume, and she went to nightclub and picked up a girl. girl really thought that she's a boy. And that was the final decision to use her in both parts. Actually, another thing, I really love it. I, I, it it's not my first film where uh, one actor plays two roles. I love the actors playing two roles. Oh, yeah, especially when the roles are very, very different. And, uh, of course, right. Anne playing a male and a female. And right. um, I love the, the various hairstyles, like that kind of David Bowie <laughs> thing she had, and where she's, like, painting her face up, and you just see her face, and the paint is just kind of uh, neoned on as she's putting it on. And I, I, I love stuff like that, very stylistic. I love that. Actually, we made a lot of tests of makeup and tried different variants of Jimmy, not of them blonde. But finally, I chose this blonde David Bowie variant as most logical. Yes. And, uh, of course, you had some other interesting people in this film, too, because uh, we have, uh, I'm hoping to pronounce this right, Otto von uh, Wormher, playing Johann yeah. Hoffman. He's, of course, the, the German scientist who's Right. Spotted. Well, yeah. He spotted, yeah, of course, was, the flying saucer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it actually was uh, a, per, a real person. He, uh, when we were developing previous film, which didn't happen, he uh, and, and Bob Brady, who was playing, uh, playing in Liquid Sky, the acting teacher. Yep. He is. He was acting teacher, and he was our casting director. Uh, for previous film and for Liquid Sky, for both of them. And then uh, this German guy came to him and brought his... uh, He never played one role in his life, so his resume was about what kind of food he likes, what kind of music he likes, what kind of girls he likes. It was funny but meaningless uh, resume. And I looked at the photograph and said, 
to Bob. Bob, that's a fantastic face. I would like to use him in the film. And Bob said, but he's not an actor. He cannot act. So we decided still to invite him. And then he came. He immediately became Bob's student. And then, you know, at the moment that we started Liquid Sky, he already played in several of our Broadway productions. And he really became an actor. So we wrote this role specially for him and used a lot of words, uh, uh, expressions that he really, really used in his real life. I liked him in the film, too, because, of course, he knows that the uh, the UFO is on the roof, you know, and he's set up and in uh, this complex there so he can s- see what's going on, of course. Uh, he's kind of like uh, our window into uh, this extraordinary circumstances that's happening. I like how he was written into it. Well, well as I said, we used, we used his real character, and I really liked very much German elements of this because yeah, obviously it was a part of the, of, of the entire structure. It was important to have a German scientist there. Yeah. And, of course, you mentioned Bob Brady, of course, played the character of Owen, the college drama teacher, and, of course, uh, uh, tries to assist uh, uh, Hoffman. And he, of course, becomes one of many who uh, gets into uh, a sexual situation with the Margaret character, played by Anne Carlyle. And, of course... Right, and both Anne and he are most close, the real characters mostly close to Liquid Sky. It's very personal for both of them. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, I here here's something I, I, I wanted to ask you, because there yes. comes a point where somebody dies in the film, but you see a lot of you see a lot of bodies except for one disintegrate, but they got that one body when Adrian comes up and they wrap it up and why didn't that body disintegrate? Well, uh, there, is a, there is a scene there, then, uh, then Margaret goes to the roof to speak with, with this unknown yet to her alien, and she asks him uh, to disintegrate the body. She says that she doesn't know, to, know what to do with this body, and after that they start disintegrating. Oh, okay. All right. And of course, uh, Susan uh, uh, Dukes plays, of course, Sylvia, another seed stealing part. Yes. yes. Yeah, I like some of these uh, characters, these supporting players that can come in and out. And then, of course, like they're like in these outside apartment complexes looking in, but then you got this this uh, fashion event that's going on uh, in this one one. Uh, uh, apartment complex there. Uh, it's all very bright, very, very vibrant, and uh, I like the uh, the kind of the two sides there, one looking in, and then you got one right there, kind of in the danger zone, especially when uh, the challenge is out when it comes to disintegrating and, and uh, those climatic moments. Well, uh, location, both locations and special effects were again where the, like like the cast, they were existed before the script was written. I mean, the Anne, Anne was living at the moment they started writing. She was living in a small apartment, uh, looking to the roof, not the apartment which is in the film. But I immediately said, okay, that will be our main location, and then. Uh, and met a girl who said, oh, you're interested in the apartments on the roof. I have one like that, and I want to leave it. Do you want to rent it? So actually, we rented this apartment before script was written. It was the first investment in the film, because we knew that we need this apartment for the film. And with disintegration and all that as well, you know, the director of photography, Yuri Neyman, whom I knew, or he's from Russia as well, I knew him from the time he was 15 years old, uh, film amateur who who was introduced to me like a genius and uh, so I knew him a long time and uh, before immigrating to America he made several big films in Russia shot and besides of shooting them he was very involved in special effects he loved special effects and did them very good 
And actually myself and all my films before Liquid Sky, I made all the special effects myself as well because I love them very much. So it was logical for me to decide that we make a, a low-budget film which would look good and will have special effects, which is very unusual for low-budget films. And we planned all those effects before before we started shooting. And actually, it was planned so good that, uh, that the effects really were made uh, during the time of, of editing of the film. And last effect was shot the day that we finished editing. It was exactly planned exactly in time. Yeah, I love the very, very neon look to the special effects. Like, that really stands out. I think it was very uh, uh, innovative, very creative. And um, where where did you come up with the idea for the look of the film? Well, that probably was one of the first things, because my, my main love at this moment was Andy Warhol, and uh, one of one of ideas was to make uh, Andy Warhol. I loved Andy Warhol's not only paintings, his films as well, but his films were very elite, just for uh, for small uh, circle of specialists who could love it. Uh, he never managed to make films which would be as uh, generally attractive as his paintings. And I, my idea was that I should make film with the same ideas like in the workers, but for film. Uh, so we wanted image like that. And obviously I wanted a lot, a lot of neon light there. Uh, actually, one of top Canadian critics, I don't remember his name, wrote that that's a film which shows neon... Uh, neon, uh, I forgot exactly how it was. It's like neon underwear of Andy Warhol's world, something like that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, obviously, we've had a lot of uh, conversations before with my. Uh, uh, then future DP Yuri Neyman about how to make it, and obviously nobody shot films in neon, uh, real neon light. But Yuri said that he can do it. It wasn't easy. We had a lot of problems because the film really was lit with neon light. Sometimes people asking me if it was all improvisation. It certainly wasn't improvisation, because when you shoot with neon light, you have depth of focus less than one inch. And you cannot, actors cannot move. It's very difficult for actors to play and not get out of focus. No no way to improvise this way. And it was very difficult for Yuri, for everybody, actually for sound, because neon lights are very noisy and you cannot stop this noise. Uh, but we went through all these things. And then we made this film. It wasn't easy for laboratory. Actually, right now we're preparing... Uh, we're preparing re-release and first time digitizing and restoring the film. And uh, right now is the color correction made, and it's a very complicated process. It okay, was our budget for distributor, but we think that it would look digitally even better than on a big looked on a big screen. Unfortunately, uh, you probably seen it on. DVD, this DVD doesn't give 10% of image of the film because this DVD was made from uh, from video and it's never, never, the film never was digitized. So that's the first time by the end of this ad, um, year we will have film both, uh, both uh, in DVD Blu-ray and, and we are trying to make re-release on, on screen as well. For oh, perfect. I want to get this so, on Blu-ray, yes. I'm glad to hear that. Know, that's that you will get it, and if you know Canadian uh, theaters would know and would want to make a premiere on of a digital variant, I would certainly would be happy to do it. Oh, gee, yeah, I'd love to see a screening of that film. Um, I definitely want to get it on Blu-ray, and I've looked up to see if it's out on Blu-ray. It's not yet, but I'm glad that glad you just cleared that up for me because that that is a film I'd like to get. It, it made that much of an impression on me. Um, 
But I, I did want to bring up something, though. You did a wonderful job on the music in the film, and I loved it there. That first shot, you see that masked face, that neon bluish mask face, and the music is just very, very riveting, riveting, you know? And then you get the club music, and then you get little quiet moments between uh, uh, Bob Brady and, um, and Ann Carlyle where the music is very, very calm, but kind of almost in a, uh, there's a little bit almost a tension there, but yet a calm tension in, in their little scene together. And there's always music playing. Um, was that um, something that you had planned from the start? Yes, I planned the character of music from the very beginning. And I knew that I want to have uh, music uh, like naive circus but electronic because that would be exactly so I, I i you know i exactly knew what i want and i asked all that back it was back then if you know no it was before time of a computer music it doesn't didn't exist we were only first synthesizers and i still have somewhere a big box of all the Zima tapes of all the electronic composers of new york who were giving me this Zima tapes and all of them didn't understand what I want. I wanted it primitive and they wanted it sounding like a big symphony orchestra. They just didn't understand why I wanted primitive. So uh, so uh, then film already was short and we still had no composer. We just we had a composer who wrote uh, 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 me and my recent box but uh, you know not a composer for entire film. So so somebody told me that there is new 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 invention a machine called firelight computer musical oh. instrument and only three places in new york have it it was really the first computer specially designed to make music with it and one of places was so-called pass public access synthesizers it was a uh, you know, was a place which for small money was helping young musicians to to learn how to use synthesizers. And they had, had this thing. And I had two young composers, Brenda Hutchinson and Clive Smith, who were authorized by constructors to teach others to use it. And for money, they were helping people to put their music in, into this computer. So I came there, and I invited Brenda to write the music. Brenda, why Brenda? Why not Clive? Because I don't know. Just because I always prefer to work with women. Uh, in this in this this choice, I wasn't tried because Brenda had absolutely opposite to my taste, and work was moving very slow. And finally, Brenda said, "Me listen. It looks like you know what you want so well. Why wouldn't you write this music yourself?" <coughs> I said, yes, I can do it if you would help me, as you helping to everybody in the past, help me to put it in the computer. She said, okay, and we started working with her. And, you know, some music I was uh, right, was singing or playing one finger myself. I am not a musician. And some, which was, uh, again, an idea from the very beginning, I used the music, mostly old classic music, 18th century or or American, early American music. And uh, and we were putting that in the computer. Then Brenda left because she had different plans. And I started working with Clive, which most of the music I made with Clive, doing exactly like, like that. Uh, I, was, uh, I was singing or playing one finger, and Clive was putting it in the computer, and then we were putting... Giving, giving voices to that. Back then, the sampling didn't exist. Actually, all the sounds of instruments were created by Brenda and Clive. They they made these samples. And that sounds very special, special way. Yeah, I, I love the music and the the music just it's like an its own character in the movie and just for, like I said from the opening scene, very very vibrant, you know and I. I um, was it difficult to choose uh, the type of music you wanted to use for each scene? Because I know there's some places where it's a little bit quieter, and some it's very riveting. 
Well, uh, I don't know it was difficult. I just knew what I like, and I knew where to choose. So, like uh, like speaking about 18th century music, I more or less knew where I want to find it. And with early American, that really was research. I never knew about these composers before. And I found some there, and others, you know, I just played myself. And it, I, I don't think it was difficult. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, and of course you have moments, of course, like where where uh, Paula Shepard is singing and whatnot too. And uh, was was uh, the lyrics and whatnot for the songs like how did that come about? Who was responsible for that? And where did those ideas that come from? Lyrics are written by me. That's my my, and I had this idea because this music box is there now. Probably not everybody knows what music box is, but that's this box which make a quick rhythm track. Today everybody can do it in his computer without any problem. Okay. Right. Now, of course, the film uh, was released in 1982. Now, I was wondering if you remember that. For I, I believe you. I believe it was released. What was it? Montreal. Well, it was uh, first shown in '82 in Montreal Film Festival, as I said already to you. And then, generally, it was released in '83. But, but uh, you know, they they write that '82 because the Montreal Film Festival was in '82. Do you remember that audience? Absolutely, I remember it very well. I really remember how this success came because it was very close to what we wanted to get. Because the first day, uh, nobody knew anyone, no, 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 there was no known actors, no unknown director. So the first day of the festival, film played very good in the evening with, with half-empty uh, theater. And next day, uh, there was a rain, and film played in the morning, and all the other films played in empty theaters, and Liquid Sky was completely sold out, and people were sitting on the floor. And I was standing there listening to what audience tell, and I seen uh, like a boy and girl getting out of the theater after the film, and, uh, and and boy was like shocked by the film, and girl was telling him, I told you what kind of film it is. I told you what kind of this is. A girl seen it previous evening and brought her boy next next day. And this shocked boy probably will come next day bringing, uh, bringing somebody else to the film. So, so that that how that how it works, and it worked like that all the time. Uh, at all the festivals, it always was sold out. And actually, in New York, in Boston, in Washington D.C., film played almost four years not stop, non-stop. I don't think if any other film ever had this type of success. It was all the time sold out. Were real lines, and actually, then they. In the fourth year, they got it out of the theaters. They got it out of the theaters not because it wasn't sold out. They they just had give place to other films. They just couldn't hold it so long. And of course, um, it ended up also ended up playing the midnight circus uh, circuit as well. Like the like the Rocky Horror Picture Show it became an event picture, you know, and uh, that yeah, must have. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, it's not unfortunately, really less than they wanted. The theaters wanted it for midnight shows all the time. I was against it uh, for many years because I thought that this kind of film needs a new release uh, instead of night, a new normal release because new audience grown up. It was the Disney idea was that every his film should be opened again every seven years because the new generation grows up. And actually today, then we have screenings of Liquid Sky, there are mostly young audience there, and the reaction of their reaction is fantastic, even better than it was 35 years ago. One scene, of course, that always gets talked about is when uh, Anne Carlyle is on screen, of course, both as Margaret and Jimmy, you know, and of course, uh, back then, that, that kind of uh, stuff was tricky would you like to talk about the process of her being on on screen uh yes, yes, yes. i knew from the beginning that well actually it was a very interesting challenge to, to have this you know the same access play to 
parts of sexual act, you know, how to make it. And uh, as the entire film, especially this scene, we knew that more, more than a half of the film happening in the same room. So director of photography, Yuri and me, we spent a lot of time just breaking down the scenes to have different lights for different parts of the scenes, to have dramatic development of light, uh, and to have, like, our common la language with Yuri was, okay, now it's light num number five, or now it's light number 17. And in this scene, uh, dialogue really very similar in different parts of the scene. So uh, when we were shooting it, and I was telling Yuri, like, light num number seven. And he said, how can it be? It just was number two, and it's the same words. He couldn't understand, but he did what I was saying. And we had young girl script supervisor. She was crying in the middle of the shooting because she absolutely lost record and couldn't understand as well what's going on and why why lights are changing and what what's going on. And, uh, you know, it's pretty complicated because all the split screens, uh, then and, uh, and uh, in both roles in the same time on the screen, we were shooting. Uh, today in computer era, it would be very easy to do, but back then we could do it only inside of the camera. We were shooting one half of the of, of the frame, then the film was uh, returned back to the beginning, and we were shooting second part of the of, of the film, and we were shooting it in a small apartment uh, in the real building, which everything is moving around, so if camera would be touched or moved a little bit during this period, that's so you should, it's complete waste, you cannot use it. So it was technically very difficult, besides of changing uh, male to female or female to male makeup, makeup was taking more than two hours. So you shoot half of the frame, and you're waiting for two hours to shoot second half of the frame, and then start all over again to 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 make sec second take. It was taking every shot like that was taking entire day. So so it was you know obviously very difficult to to uh, to follow up in this particular scene because it was many days and the light was changing all the time. But I was pretty sure about what I was doing. Deep in the heart, I wasn't so sure because it really was very complicated. And when we started editing into this scene, I really was nervous. But it turned out that everybody, well, everything was shot right and, and we edited it pretty easily. I like the fact, too, that the, the, the UFO, or the flying saucer, is the size of a dinner plate. Where, where did you come up with the idea of uh, having the flying saucer be small? Actually, that probably was the first idea from which the film start, started. I didn't know yet who, what would be plot and who will be characters, but I thought that ir ironic, uh, uh, ironic uh, comment on all the uh, UFO obsession, which was back then. It, you remember it was uh, Spielberg's uh, Close Encounters and E.T. It was well, back then that people really wanted to see a solution of all the problems uh, from the uh, aliens from out of space. So I wanted to to uh, make ironic spoof of that, and that uh, it came to my mind that it would be very good to have a flying saucer the size of a real saucer, and, and the alien, which has no shape, which sits inside of this saucer. That was the first idea. Now, I read online that there is supposed to be a sequel to Liquid Sky. Is that still going to go through? Yes, yes. We almost finished script with and uh, we I'm not I don't want actually to finish it before we really know a source of financing and what kind of budget we're dealing with because some things will depend on budget. But we actually are ready to start the, the moment we will have money and we're still working on it. And we actually wanted to connect the release of films some way. Now I think that the release will show uh, how many audience want it, and it would be easier to easier to finance Liquid Sky 2. Is it going to have the uh, same look as the previous film, or is it going to uh, um, go hand-in-hand hand with how special effects have evolved? Well, obviously special effects evolve, and it cannot cannot influence 
But I think the look depends not on technical side, but of change of, of taste, of change of style which is going in the world. So no, it, I don't think the look will be, it will be as striking as there, but uh, I have different feeling for the look, the same like with the music and with everything. Style is changing. Actually, for many years, there were a lot of producers who wanted to make, to make Liquid Sky 2, and I always didn't know how to do it. I was saying, no, I don't know. At, 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 at one point, there was a Japanese company, and I even wrote something for them which they didn't like because it was not not at all like Liquid Sky One, and they wanted it as close as possible to Liquid Sky One. But I didn't know how to do it, and that's not long ago this idea came to me, to my mind, clear clear vision what should be Liquid Sky Two. And I think it's not only because I'm so I'm I'm turned lucky at that moment. It's because the time is changing. Today, almost almost all the successful films of the 80s made remakes and sequels to them because the 80s are very much in mind of people. It doesn't mean that it's exact uh, copy of the style. It's a different style, but something from the 80s really coming back. Yes, and I know Anne Carlyle is, is supposed to make a return for this. Uh, um, how's that going with her? Is she excited about this? Oh, yes, yeah, she's very excited and wants to do it as soon as possible. But as, as you know, it depends on financing. Is uh, she going to have a dual role? or, is she, or is... No, no, it's not a dual role. She, well, I can say that she's playing the same Margaret coming back. Uh, I don't know whether this could happen or not, but uh, I was wondering, will Paula Shepard come back? No, I'm afraid there is no way to find you. And even if I'll find you, I don't think she would want to play. Oh, that's unfortunate. And actually, it's not, it's not the same character. It's the same character, only Margaret, who's coming back. But she's coming in a new, new today's world. And, and other other characters, like a character played by Paula, if you remember, is killed in the. Yeah, film. I know, but I because it's kind of a and um, got the alien background, you know. There's always this reincarnation thing that they do in these uh, these kind of sci-fi um, films and whatnot. That's why that's why I brought it up. But I love Paula in the film, so <laughs> that's kind of. Well, I you... like Paula in any other film. Yeah, actually, I tried. To, what I'm saying, not. Neither me nor the people who made Alice with Alice man- managed to do it. So it looks like she really doesn't want. Uh, well, Anne Carlyle was wonderful. I'm glad she's coming back. And uh, is, is there, uh, for the sequel, now I, I don't want you to give away too much for us, but is there um, the contrast in terms of its uh, screenplay? Is there going to be a, a whole different... Uh, route you go in terms of the storytelling as opposed to before, like in terms of the plot? Well, I don't know what to tell you to tell the truth. I don't want to give away <laughs> anything of the plot. Uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do at this no, point. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. I don't I don't want you to sabotage your film. But I got to say I'm I'm looking forward to it and I'm really glad that there's going to be a sequel to it and uh I hope it comes through through well. I Actually, we have site uh www.liquidskythemovie.com and everybody who comes to this site and pushes button or just on the first page of the site uh, gets on the list of the people who who get all the information about what's going on with Liquid Sky, including releases, including uh, making Liquid Sky two. Actually, it's very possible that we would want every, every all, all the fans of Liquid Sky to be involved in, in some way in the development of Liquid Sky two. So. So I invite everybody to go to the site, to push the button, and to get on our list. Okay, I'm going to have to do that. So that's www.liquidsky.com? No, liquidskythemovie.com. Oh, okay. Liquidskythemovie.com. Unfortunately, Liquid Sky was already used by somebody. Okay. Well, perfect. Well, you know what? Uh, how do you feel 35 years and and people still talk about your movie and people like myself discover it and marvel at its, uh, uh, its look and its innovation? 
Well, I don't know. I guess we are lucky, uh, besides of the fact that uh, it's probably... You know, when we wrote the script, uh, we had a close... Pro- uh, I don't know. I'd better not, not to speak of these things. But that's, you know, that's happened this way. And good. 35 years, and the film's gained a massive cult following, and uh, and people are like myself still discovering it. And uh, like I said, I, I love films that are creative and innovative and different, and Liquid Sky was definitely that. And um, it was quite a, an interesting uh, discovery for me this year. So uh, I look forward to the sequel. And um, do, you, do you have any other f- film projects coming up, or is that, that your only big project? No, there's a lot of films I made during this period. The uh, la- last one was rele- released, a uh, film called Perestroika, which I shoot in Russia, but, but with American actors, including the Murray Abraham, Oscar winning, and I think one of the best actors of our time. Okay. And, uh, and uh, well, it was released. It's uh, easy, to, easy to get it all over the place. Do you uh, do the conventions? You and Anne do the conventions? Like the fan conventions? Mm, Fan conventions? No. Mm, We didn't do it, but probably can do it. Yeah, because... Yeah, I think that that, I think that would be a good showing. Well, eventually, towards hopefully towards the end of the year, I'm going to see if I can get uh, Anne Carlyle come on here to talk about this film as well and further celebrate this film's uh, 35th anniversary. I want to thank you for making this film because (laughs) it tells me you you and various others get. Unfortunately, it's uh, difficult to make films like that because it's difficult to finance them. People usually, it's much easier to, to uh, finance something which is a copy of previous films than something different. I like different, and this was definitely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I look forward to the Blu-ray release. I'm definitely going to get this on Blu-ray. You going to do like a commentary track or anything like that on it? Yes, yes, everything is made already. You'll see it. Oh, perfect. I am looking forward to that. That is definitely on my uh, list of films to purchase. And and uh, we're celebrating, of course, the 35th anniversary of Liquid Sky with its director, Slava Zakaman. And uh, I want to say thank you again for coming on today and talking about this film and uh, talking about your experience making this film. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes. I was wondering if before you go, if you would mind doing a plug for my show. You're listening to Greg Gilbert on the Python Sparrow.